When I started to look at, at the NHS, I, I had a bit of experience in hospitals um, around the world. I've been in many, many systems around the world talking to people. And one of the things you learn is that high quality and good cost control go together. And they're part of the same management discipline. If you know how to actually get your hospital under control, in a sense qualitatively, getting your surgeons doing the right thing, the nurses doing the right thing, often, actually almost totally, you get good financial controls as well. And very clearly, I mean, we talked about Francis. There's no doubt that in any healthcare system, one thing is not negotiable, it's quality. And we often used to pat ourselves on the back before Francis, Francis think we, thinking we were doing some, you know, many things right, and Francis proved that we were not. Similarly, in terms of value, um, we have to be equally uh, determined to make sure that we have a high value system. And the work which I conducted in the previous 18 months showed massive unwarranted variations in how providers spend money. And the key is the word unwarranted. Um, clearly, if you've got a hospital built in the 1890s, many, many old wings, old heating, inefficient layouts of wards, you're going to actually be a more expensive thing to run than somebody who's got a brand new hospital without a PFI. So it's understanding the differences and understanding it uh, line by line. But what we concluded going through the work was that we could, in 2020, look at saving five billion pounds a year out of the acute sector. And I'll just take you through the sort of big numbers. I think many of you would be familiar with them. But I just want to sort of remind us and put it in the total context, two things to remember. First of all, the NHS in England costs £120 billion a year to run. Um, we spend on healthcare about 7% of GDP, 7.1% of GDP, one of the lowest in the developed world. And probably, if you are absolutely objective, as the Commonwealth Fund has been, is probably one of the best value healthcare systems in the world. Good access, not bad outcomes, etc., etc. All the key things that we'd want. And yet, it's not good enough. I think the citizen feels it. I think the financial pressures feel it. And one of the reasons it isn't good enough is because it's inconsistent. It's inconsistent sometimes in quality, and it's certainly uh, inconsistent in, times of, in terms of value. And I think one of the things that comes down to is the issue of management, and also what is the core business of an NHS acute hospital? What is it really there to do? And what should it let others do or seek to get others to help it do? Now, if you look at acute trust, we're going to go on and look at community and mental health. But acute trust uh, roughly spend about 50, 56 billion a year of that 120 billion. And just a one figure I would suggest you carry away is VAT in the whole of the United Kingdom is 120 billion. That is what that tax collects. So if you take the whole of VAT and give it to the NHS in England, that's what we spend. Now, if the NHS in England does not save five billion a year, it's going to have to find the money from somewhere. And if you are simplistic about it, the mathematicians in the room can work out what the rate of VAT would have to go to if we don't actually find these savings. It's got to be paid for somewhere. These aren't free goods. So all the time, it's the balance between doing what we want and getting the value out of it. And so of that, and the key factor we looked at, the, the, the whole thing in this was of that 56 billion, about 34 billion is staff. You know, it's a labor intensive business. It's lots of nurses, lots of care assistants, lots of doctors. And therefore, central to the work we did was to try and understand the productivity of, uh, of that cohort. Um, and what was extraordinary were the variations, you know, right the way across, across the board. And I'll come back to those in a moment. Clinician variations, nursing variations, etc. But taking the broad package of five billion, we thought we could get two billion out of workforce. Um, a billion out of pharmacy, a billion out of uh, procurement. You know, I'm not going to bore people with the inconsistent buying of rubber gloves. It's been hammered to death. Um, but at one point I would make is, it's not the price often, it's the stock control and the quantity we use. And it's the same thing with pharmacy. If you go around and look at out-of-date pharmaceutical products on the shelves of our hospitals, it's absolutely appalling. And I'm reminded, looking at this ceiling, of a very good stock control system in one hospital where many of you may know knee joints and things are on consignment. Knee joints are in a room, locked door. At the end of the month, the hospital and the vendor come in, count the stock. This went on for many years until one day the ceiling collapsed in the room and it's because the vendor, the salesman, had pushed 
the tile up and shoved a few joints in there. So the sales went up, the hospital got billed, hadn't got a control system, paid the money. It's only when 100 of them fell on somebody's head that the weakness in the system was revealed. Now, I don't want the HSJ reporting this, uh, but you know, this is just a bit of anecdote to lend strength to the argument that we have not been very good at, in many hospitals, at controlling the things we use because often people see them as free goods. The other area is estates, and I'll come to that in a moment, but just to suffice to say, we have massive, massive estates in the NHS, and I suppose one key figure was space used clinically. About the whole system, about only 65% of a hospital space is used for clinical uh, duties, as it were. The rest is offices and other things. And in the course of this work, some work I'd done for the government on property, we talked to the United States government about this many, about two years ago, and they had the same problem with the military. And their answer was, they called a ball and chain policy, and they just go around and knock buildings down that weren't being used. And what it proved absolutely conclusively was you didn't insure them, you didn't guard them, and you didn't heat them. And you were very rigorous about actually what estate you needed to provide it. And I come back to the question time and time again, what should the core service of an acute provider in this country be? Anyway, we had lots of recommendations, you usually do. The key thing is how do you get rid of unwarranted variations? How do you put a system of management in which identifies, one, what good looks like? What should a hospital be doing on a line-by-line -line basis about everything it does? I'll give you a couple of examples. How many actually joint replacements should a surgeon do? You know, there are the great law of averages. Over time, these things come out. And you'd be amazed. Some hospitals, five. Some hospitals, two. Saturday morning, sometimes you find somebody who's doing two in the NHS in the week will do five in the private hospital on a Saturday. Now. Things are different, things aren't quite as well organised maybe, etc. But getting the explanation for those and managing them, and then looking at the clinical outcomes. How many readmissions do we have to have? Who's bungling it? Who's got high infection rates? All these things, getting them into a system. And what the hospital said to us as we went round, this was very iterative. And I hope you'll take from this the sense that we knew nothing when we started. We had a series of propositions that said, this is your data, it looks like this, we can't quite understand it, would you tell us what it is? Gradually, as we went around the country, people explained themselves, and people said, oh, maybe we could do this a little bit better. And actually, if you look at those things, we presented this data, and medical directors time and time again said, you know, we've had, never had data like this before. We can now engage with our clinical colleagues to say, but over there, similar sort of hospital to us seems to be doing this a bit better. How can we organize ourselves to do it? So I think the real thing, that critical thing, is getting that comparable data. And one of the key issues for us, how did we get a data set that actually let us compare various hospitals? Everybody says, but that's a 700 bed one and it has this mix of things, and this is a 1500 bedder, and this is a 100 bed hospital over here, and they're all different. Well, let me report that around the world there are many, many hospital systems that 20 or 30 years ago faced the same problem. No, surprise, surprise, they, they solved it. And you come up with something like a weighted activity unit, which the Australians use and the Americans use a variation of and the Germans use. In fact, everybody's got a system like it apart from us. So we managed to devise a system which actually presented this data. People had a go at it. You know, everybody always wants to argue about the data, don't they? But actually, if you sit down with people and say, well, fine, we'll amend it. Tell us what's right and we'll, we'll clean it up. And do you agree now? And gradually, we got some agreement on it. And then people started to say, do you know, we might be able to do that a bit better. Maybe if we did this a little bit better, and I'll come to a story in a moment on, um, on pharmacy. So if you look at it, what we're after were those big numbers uh, and how to do it. And I'll give you a couple, couple of examples. If you take this weighted activity unit, this basically means that you add up all the activity and you add up the money and you divide one into the other and you get that. So if you look in England, the average uh, across the country is 3,500 pounds in a weighted activity unit. Cheapest was 3160, and the most expensive was actually 3850. Well, very significant variances in there. So you start to think to yourself, maybe, and these are unwarranted. These are these are ones where you can't expect. How do we get those averages up? And then if you have a look at something like nursing, I'll give you a very good example. We collected data from more than a thousand wards, and we analysed it. Similar ward, similar ward for this. And what we found was. 100 acute hospitals have bought rostering systems. I don't know if anybody is in the room for the rostering vendors, but if they are, they will know everybody bought one and four people used them. 
And what you find time and time again is people think the board makes a decision and we never execute. We've bought it, the board thinks they've solved it, but it never gets used properly. And so we've spent the money and yet we have, and yet you go to other healthcare systems, they're right on it. And if mid-staffs had had electronic rostering and control, they would have seen in the blink of an eye, there weren't enough nurses, and there weren't enough nurses of the right type. So getting those controls in is really central. And if you look across the whole system, what you roughly see is hours of care a day. And I can tell you it's 9.1 hours of care a day. is what, on average, we deliver to take care of an NHS patient, OK? I could take you to hospitals where it's 16.8 hours a day, and I can take you to hospitals where it's 6.3. Now, what we have to arrive at is what is right, and that's what's coming out of the so-called model hospital exercise. What is the right level of care for that ward? What is the right skill mix? How does it work? And I think the guidance that people asked us for was this. What does good look like? And we were talking to one very, very serious big acute provider about their radiology department, and it was hopeless. The data was, it was their data was hopeless. And we went through it, and you know they couldn't get people on and off the scanner beds properly, and they weren't got the reservation system right, and all that sort of good stuff, you know. And uh, it's quite a painful exercise, really. And then the chief exec said to me, more or less, "Well, look, you're a bit of a smart ass. What's the right answer then? What should my hospital be doing in my radiology department? What does good look like?" And what we set out to do was slowly provide those answers to people. This is what good looks like. Over time, this is what we will fund to. Now, if you can't run your radiology department properly, or you can't run your pathology department properly, find somebody to help you who can. Because this is how much we're going to allow for that procedure, and we're going to be more and more granular over time, and therefore the, the data will show who's good at this, and if it isn't, you have to find a better way of doing it. And that's what we're encouraging. And do you know what? People have responded really well. And I'll come to the story of the pharmacy. So. We went to one of our cohort of hospitals, Salisbury. And we go down there, we explain what we're doing. and we go back a second time and a third time. And the third time we go back, and the chief pharmacist, she's just retired now, she said, I said, how's it going? She said, do you know, we just found a way of taking 62,000 a year out of that line. And two weeks ago, we found a way of taking 78,000 out of that line. And we found 17,000 in that line. And she had a list of about 10 things, okay? And they added up to a lot of money. Why I'm telling you this is because there aren't any silver bullets in this. There's no one button you can press and we transform it. It's about good people understanding what good looks like and systematically working their way through it to make sure that they get every pound of value they can out of what they're spending. And to remind you, we spend 5.3 billion on drugs in hospitals. If we can get to the bottom of bad stock control, if we can get to substitution, a very good example is, um, anybody is here from the anesthesiology market, but you will know that the day case uh, anesthetic costs 10 times the price of an inpatient anesthetic. And yet you go to some hospitals, everybody gets day case anesthesia. And yet we're paying for inpatient care. Rock on, I mean, why, why would you do it? So, you know, and I can tell you 101 examples. I'm constrained for time, so, and Alistair's got that sort of Darth Vader death stare on me, so I better, better push on. I just want to sort of recap and come back to a few things. Is this. You've got to get staff right. Anything anybody can do as an external vendor, whether you, you actually, you understand how rotors work, you can bring those sort of understandings to it. I think we have a massive technology uh, problem in the NHS. I'm sure you've talked about it today. The national program, well, I don't need to say any more, do I? Um, you know, we are one of the worst served uh, uh, healthcare mm -hmm. systems for technology. Uh, there's no doubt about it. And I've seen many, many uh, of them. How can you run 21st century care without electronic patient records? How can you run it without things being joined up? How can you run it without care pathways? You know, we can do better. Uh, having a PaaS system is not modern IT. So you've got to get staffing right. You've then got to work your way through all those things uh, we've described. And a couple of things in that are, are critical. I think first is we've got to start to measure nursing hours of care a day. And we've got to show exactly how many people are in, how many people are working on those wards, and work out those inconsistencies. I'll tell you of one hospital where we looked at the data, February data, 
And we couldn't understand why the agency bill had gone through the roof and the hours were down. Blah, blah, blah. And then we found out that they'd let half of their nursing staff take half term off. Now, we are a friend, you know, we're an employee friendly organisation. We're very proud of it. But we do have some patients to take care of as well. And when you get practice like that, who are we running that hospital for? You have to ask yourself the question. It's the same thing with sickness, okay? I was in a hospital the other day, the sickness had drifted out. You could see it. It had gone from 2 to nearly 6%. Big hospital, billion pound a year. And I said to the, what is going on? They said, we took our eye off it. We took our eye off it, okay? 3% drift on a 600 million pound wage bill. We took our eye off it. Yeah, I mean, is that acceptable? I mean, I, to me it isn't. And it's not about another initiative. It's about getting up every day and saying, am I doing what I expected to do? Have I got the right staff in? Are they doing what we expect them to do? Have I got the right outturns? It's, it's not an episodic thing. It's an everyday thing that we have to do. I think e-rostering, we should, we should get in, we're getting it in. I think we've got a hospital pharmacy transformation program. We've had great engagement. And on things like diagnostics and imaging, I think new, new things are emerging. We've had some challenges on uh, certainly pathology. The Cambridge East of England thing has not been a success. Other things have. Uh, and gradually we're seeing now the rationale coming in that. And I'll tell you one little anecdote. When I looked at pathology, I was in a big hospital and it had a wonderful analyzer. I don't know if anybody's here in the analyzer business. It had an analyzer that went from that pillar to that pillar, and it was absolutely the state of the art. And I said to the management, wow, you know, I said, it's good, isn't it? I said, wonderful. How many hours a day does it run for? They said six and a half. I said, oh, that's very interesting, isn't it? You know, maybe you do a bit better. And they said, well, we're trying, you know, we're trying, but you know. Four weeks later, I was in a trust 20 miles away, and they had an analyzer that went from that pillar to that pillar plus. And I said, oh, how interesting. How many hours a day does your analyzer run for? They said, seven. I said, oh, that's good, isn't it? I said, didn't I see one like that a few weeks ago? Ah, oh, they said, ours is four feet longer. Now, how long can we put up with this crap? That's what I ask you, realistically. We are out of money, OK? We're out of money. As a nation, we're out of money. and the NHS, we're challenged. We all believe in quality. Surely to goodness, it's time actually we manage to hold up a mirror to ourselves and say, we better do some of this better and quicker. And I think, therefore, what we're working on at, with NHSI is this, is how to build an interface with the trusts that actually discusses with them what good looks like. To discuss how you can partner, how actually some people should not be running their back offices. They should actually get somebody else to do it. Because I come back to the core question, what is an acute hospital? And I sort of end by telling you this. Uh, last year I was in a hospital called Virginia Mason, which is very beloved of the English NHS. It's in Seattle, Washington State. And I proudly say I went there under my own steam. I paid my own ticket. The Department of Health didn't. And I walked around with the woman running trauma and orthopedics. And I said to her, so tell me your average length of stay for a total hip. And you know when you know you've asked the wrong question, her face went sort of dark. Oh, you know. She said, it's, uh, it's 56 hours. That's not going to sound too bad to me. What should it be? She said, it should be 52. I said, oh, well, you know. But we're going to get to 52, she said. I came back to England. And uh, ours uh, is a 128 hours. Okay. Now, the reason is because in many other countries, what we've evolved is step-down care. So people are now saying acute hospital is to do that operation to get somebody basically re-able, but to get them out into a more appropriate and cheaper care setting. And if you look at one of the things that bedevils our system at the moment, there's 129,000 acute care beds. Nobody's quite sure, but anything between eight and 15,000 of those are blocked by people who should be out in some other form of care. So we need to get on and recognize what we want to use our great acutes for and what we can actually move out and get into better, lower cost and more effective settings. And I, what I'd say is this in conclusion, we're working on a model hospital, 
getting that interface and helping our colleagues in the NHS to do it, showing them what good it looks like, having that debate, that iterative debate, not some central memo that says all stand to attention at four o'clock and smile, but a memo, you know, an action, a series of actions that are tailored to the needs of that institution to meet the challenges they face, drawing on the good news, perhaps I should end on, is we have some of the great hospitals in the world. You know, I've been hospitals in many great countries. We have some fantastic hospitals, and many of them are doing it right. What we need to do is get what we know from them and help the less performing colleagues to be as good as the best we are. My belief is that if we can do that, uh, I think we, we could have the best hospital system in the world, the best healthcare system. We've got great advantages, you know. Hospital utilization rates in this country are probably the highest in the world, running at 88, 92%. You go and talk to anybody in the rest of the world, in Germany, United States, Australia, if they could run their hospitals that full, they'd absolutely love it. Average occupancy rate in an American hospital is about 54% and they don't get paid for about 5% of that because they have to treat people free if they come to the emergency room. So we've got a lot going for us, a huge amount going for us. What I would suggest we need to do is to pay more attention to tight financial control, be sort of more regular in our assessment of what we're doing, and that is the system with uh, help from colleagues in the NHS that we're seeking to build. And we've got uh, I would report to you a high degree of support for it. We just have to maintain that momentum because whichever, whatever happens, the next few years are going to be very challenging for the service. And if we want free at the point of delivery, which we all value, and a great national system to work, we do have to make value a better proposition for the citizens of this country than we've, than we've done so far. Thank you.